you know, they're your one and oh in the win column with this, you know, a guy that's going into his second year as a full time starter. So that was unbelievably positive right there. Um, to get to your point, uh, when you when you coach these guys, you got to be really careful to not make them robots. And, and uh, I mean, Jalen's been doing what he's been doing for a long, long time. And, you know, I, I saw I tried to get on my all 22 last night. And it wasn't it wasn't let me, but I did as much research as I could in, in terms of him running. And, you know, a few times I saw him get 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 down under people where he wasn't taking a direct shot. Eagles pre and post game over there at the Gallery Ocean Casino Monday Night Football. Make sure you buckle up. It's a double chin strap affair. We just heard from good friend Eric Edholm from the NFL.com. Always a pleasure talking ball with him. And coming up right now, we have our next guest making a cameo here on a football Friday. Coach John D. Filippo checking in with us once again. Coach, always a pleasure. Thanks for coming back. Rick Tone, great to be with you guys today, baby. Let's Absolutely. go. Happy Friday. Yeah, it's a football Friday, our second football Friday of the season. And, I, you know, I don't know if you saw my show. I'm all fired up, ready to go. Me too, man. I feel your energy, <laughs> Rick. Dang, let's go. Let's do it. Let's dive right into it. Jalen Hurts, to me, is a guy that just wins football games. I don't care how he gets it done. It's not always the prettiest. He was blitzed 15 times last week. Only Mahomes was blitzed more. I thought he fared well. Now, I will say, Coach, it's concerning when a quarterback takes 20 hits a game. It's concerning when he's taking helmet-to-helmet hits. And it's concerning to do that over a course of 20-plus games, which the Eagles hope to play. However, that's who Jalen Hurts is. So do you – how do you approach this style of play? Do you kind of talk him down a little bit? Do you let him be the improviser that he is? Can he sustain – that style of play over the long haul, do you think? Yeah, let's start with the positives with the Eagles in terms of what I – first off, anytime you go on the road in the NFL and score 38 points and is a good thing. Um, I, I don't care who you're playing. I don't care who the other team is, who the other coach is, who the other quarterback is. Doesn't matter. You go on the road and score 38 points, that's a great start to the season, you know, with big game Monday night against Minnesota coming in. So – you know, they're your one and oh in the win column with this, you know, a guy that's going into his second year as a full time starter. So that was unbelievably positive right there. Um, to get to your point, uh, when you when you coach these guys, you got to be really careful to not make them robots. And and uh, I mean, Jalen's been doing what he's been doing for a long, long time. And, you know, I, I saw I tried to get on my all 22 last night. And it wasn't it wasn't let me. But I did as much research as I could in, in terms of him running. And, you know, a few times I saw him get, get get down under people where he wasn't taking a direct shot. Now they probably still counted that as a quarterback hit. I think all hits aren't created equal. And so, um, you know, the what I have experience in is coaching Carson Palmer uh, later in his career, you know, in, in Oakland. And, you know, I'd always be like, hey, you know, Carson, man, t- take off and go, you know, because he'd just stand back there, stand back there. He'd be like, flip. That's, that's part of my game. He goes, I'm 6'5", 240 pounds. You know, that's part of my game. I, I can stand in there to the last minute and take that and take those shots. So, you know, that taught me a lot in terms of you, you got to be careful and, let, and, and you got to let these guys play the way they play. And so I think if you're seeing him try to get that extra yard, you know, before he gets out of bounds and getting blasts on the sidelines, to me, that that hit is created a little is a little bit higher on the on the chart than a guy that's sliding and, and getting touched. No, good points. And we talked about that last week with Carson Wentz because he had a tendency to slide head first. Right. You're right. Hurts. And I heard him talking yesterday. It goes back to his high school days because he's a big time baseball player. His father was a football coach. So early on in high school, he was taught to slide, you know, all the way up. And then he said Saban drilled it into him at Alabama and he's just continued to play that way. Now, I've heard some criticism on this network and in the media outlets in Philadelphia, that this was not the progression that they wanted to see, that this was not the next step of Jalen Hurts in the Eagles offense. I would beg to differ because I heard, I can't remember if it was Coach Seriani or uh, Steiking, basically saying, this is the offense we created for Jalen. It's, you know, everybody expects him to sit back here and be this pocket passing progression type quarterback. He, they said, no, like, 
it's really a two or three read offense. We saw, I think, 48% of the plays were off play action, a lot of RPO. But to me, like that's the secret sauce. That's the recipe for success. And they basically said by the time he gets to that third read, a lot of times the better option is tucking and running. So let me ask you, Coach, did he progress enough? Is that the offense they need to do? Should he be in the pocket more? Like, how do they move forward for the next 16 games here? You, you, it, now it's 17 games. Yeah. In the NFL season, your book is 17 chapters long and you're one and oh. And it, again, um, I, I, I give a lot of credit to Coach Sirianni and his staff because, I mean, they're not trying to put a square peg in a round hole. They're, they're letting their, their quarterback do what he does best. And, like you said earlier in the show, it's not always going to be pretty. But at the end of the day, you come out of there with a win and 38 points on the road. So I, I – and the other thing, too, is, you know, everyone's ready to crown the Super Bowl champion after week one. Everyone's getting ready to say what coaches are getting fired after week one. We have a lot of football to play, okay, a lot of football to play. So I don't think you can say, hey, you know, this young player who's still, you know, learning a lot is, is not a finished product. I think you'll see week four – You'll see, uh, you know, better, maybe better quarterback player. It, this it's going to be fun to watch him grow because whenever you have something that that's athletic, you can throw it like that. To me, as a coach, that is so fun to mold because you can do so many dynamic things with a player like that. Coach, it's like you were watching the show yesterday. I was I was right up here saying, enjoy the ride. You're watching exactly. the maturation of Jalen Hurts. We can, he's only in his third year. This is his second year as a starter. The first time he's been in the same offensive scheme since going back to high school, like the best is yet to come. I said the same exact thing. And, you know, the other question that came up in his press conference yesterday was the distribution amongst targets. Now, A.J. Brown, I think he saw 13, 15 targets. Nobody else on the team got more than four. Obviously, a big deal's been made out of Devonta Smith had zero catches. As a coach, do you address that? Do you just let it ride? Jalen said, hey, I can't call it from week to week. It's any given Sunday. What do you make of the whole ball distribution between AJ and Devonta? And does that cause drama in the locker room if it continues to be distributed that way? I don't know those two players, so I can't answer that question. But, you know, from what I hear, those two those two guys are tremendous people. So I, I doubt that from coach, coaches that I have a lot of respect for say those two players are tremendous people. So I, I doubt that. Your game plan changes each week. Um, there's some weeks you attack the opponent outside in. If they're, if they're weak in the secondary, they're, you may, may they're starting a couple of rookie corners or rookie safety. Then there's some games you, when, you know, you're playing a Patrick Peterson and Richard Sherman's and those, those type of guys where you play the game a little bit more inside out with the tight end running back matchups against the backer. So you go in on, on, on when you put the game to bed on Monday morning, you, 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 the first thing you look at as a coach is, okay, where are we better than these folks? And where is the best plan of attack where we can get our best players the ball? I mean, there's, you saw it in 17 and there are weeks we fed Alshon and, and Tory and, there's weeks we got Darren Sproles and, and, and obviously Zach Ertz involved. It's just it, 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 it's an ebb and flow of different ways you play the game. And, and you don't play each game the same, Rick. You just don't. Um, I, I, I've, you know, told I've been you know, told by people, you know, I ask defensive coaches, what do you do against a team that's struggling against the blitz? We blitz. What do you do against a team that's struggling against zone, throwing it against zone? Well, we play zone. It's the same way on offense. If you're playing a team that's struggling against the run, you run it. If you're playing the team that, like in 2018, with the uh, when I was at the Minnesota Vikings, we played the Green Bay Packers. They had three rookies in the secondary. You know, and you know we're going to run it. Like you know, it, it, with Stephon Diggs, Adam Thielen, right. that's not how you play. So that's a, again, that's a philosophical thing, and people may disagree with me. And that's fine. I mean, we can sit around and have a diet coke and talk about it, but. Um, you know, that's, that's what I believe in. And I think you watch the Eagles and, you know, they, they attack people differently each week. It's really impressive. Yeah. Put a little caffeine in my diet cook there. You got coach John D flip D Filippo here with us on a football Friday affair football playbook. Uh, Rick Saratella here with you. Make sure you hit the like button. So I want to ask you about the Vikings offense in a second here, but 
you mentioned the game plan changes from week to week. I actually like the running game plan. We saw four different rushers from four different players. It hasn't happened in 60 years here. To me, like, I liked what I saw from Miles Sanders. I think this might be the committee approach might be the best way to maximize his potential. And what you just said, do it if it works. Like I saw them go back on consecutive plays back to back, do the same play. They did 12 personnel. They brought in Stoll and Goddard on the same side. And one of them resulted in a big 24 yard run by Miles Sanders, where he had a second effort, but the vision, the patience, allowing the holes to develop and then burst and accelerate through the hole. This was about as good of a game as I saw Miles Sanders play. Would you, you said every game plan is different. Now, would you stick to that recipe of success and kind of employ the committee? We saw Kenneth Gainwell get in on the action. Even Boston Scott got more reps than I think a lot of people anticipated. Did you like that style of, uh, I think it depends on the running back room you have. Uh, There, there's certain runners that, you know, need some carries to get to get it going a little bit. You know, um, when I was in, in 19 with Leonard Fournette, you know, Leonard that year, um, he had 1,300 yards rushing, 700 yards receiving. Uh, Leonard was better as the game went along. And, uh, you know, so some backs are, are better as the game goes along than, than, than some guys, you know, it just all depends on the player to me. Like there's some guys that can, you, you know, maybe their body type's different where you only want them to get 10 to 12 rushes a game, maybe eight rushes a game over the course of the season, you know, and multiply that times 17. So I think it all depends on the player. Obviously it worked last week for the Eagles. So, you know, I would anticipate seeing the same thing going forward. By the way, your, your, your guy, uh, playoff Lenny, did you see the hit he delivered on Micah Parsons? He, who was that? I'm sorry. Uh, Leonard Fournette. He blew up oh, Mike Parsons last yeah, week. Did. Did you happen to see that one coach. Yeah. That was a really nice chip block. Yeah. Blew really him nice. up, and uh, Michael Defensive coaches don't like those. The offensive coaches keep rewinding that in the film room on Monday. <laughs> yeah, Par- Parsons was a little bit upset about it, but uh, he lit him up. That was a fun one. All right, hey, we got Coach Flip here. It's an honor and a privilege anytime we can talk with the old ball coach. Uh, you mentioned your time with the Vikings. The the offense really is explosive. I don't I don't think you want to get in a track meet with with uh, Justin Jefferson, Adam Thielen, Dalvin Cook. The Eagles had a tough, tough time wrapping up and tackling, and we saw uh, Jamal Williams and DeAndre Swift carry some defenders. We saw missed tackles all over the field. They led the league in missed tackles last week, 15 missed tackles. This Vikings offense is even more explosive. The Lions put up 35. This team is capable of being even more if you allow them to. And I I made an argument like – Hey, as good as A.J. Brown and Devonta Smith are, the Eagles fans don't like to hear it. Give me Justin Jefferson and Adam Thielen. That's a heck of a one-two combination. Going into this matchup, how do you kind of – you're not going to stop Justin Jefferson, right? No. How do you kind of try to contain him? No, and there's certain things, you know, it's it's funny you say that because when you're a coordinator, you do these things called production meetings. Uh, and you know, when you're at the national game, it's usually Joe Buck and Troy Aikman when you're an NFC team, that's the way it was. I don't know. I know they're in Amazon and all that now. Yeah. Right. But, um, Troy Aikman said something to me that was really hit home and, and made a lot of sense. He goes, you know, this will be interesting to see because the defensive coaches on both sides of the football in this game are, are really good. You can double, double people like the Patriots did against us with Thielen and Diggs. Okay, your receiving core, this is what Troy told me, is only as good as your third option, okay, whether it be a tight end or a receiver. Because if they try to take two people away and double-double on third down, okay, they're going to get their yards on first and second down with play action. They're going to get their yards. But when it's nut-cutting time and it's third and eight, okay, who is your best third option? And it makes a lot. It made a lot of sense to me. So I think you're going to see that. It'll be interesting to see who, who that third option is on on both teams. Number one, number two. I think the last time, well, in 2018, we came to Philadelphia when I was in Minnesota the year after the Super Bowl, and and and, and played the Eagles and won. Um, and it was a dogfight. And this game is going to be a dogfight as well. I mean, it's the opening opening game for in Philadelphia at the Link, and I mean that place is going to be loud. It's going to be it's going to be long back. Okay. Um, 
it's going to be awesome atmosphere. I think, uh, you know, I, I do think Minnesota is going to try to come out and run it a little bit early. Uh, I do. That would, wouldn't shock me at all. Um, Kevin O'Connell is a really good football coach. I worked with him in Cleveland. He was the quarterback coach when I was the OC there. Mm, and um, interesting. so okay. it's going to be a really good game. I wanted to pick your brain about this one, Kevin O'Connell. I was talking about him earlier in the show. Bad job on me by not realizing you crossed paths with him in, in Cleveland there. So I want to pick your brain on him because he seems like a bright young coach. I remember him coming out, it seems like yesterday, uh, covering him for the draft. But he's from the Sean McVay tree. I really like the coaching staff. He surrounded himself, a very well-experienced staff. Seems like he knows what he doesn't know. I'm curious, uh, you worked – day in and day out with this man in the building. What can you tell us about Kevin O'Connell? Yeah, my first uh, time I crossed paths with Kevin was uh, actually at the New York Jets. Uh, he was a player for us. He had gotten released by the New England Patriots, and we signed him with the Jets. That's right. So, and then uh, that's where Mike Pettin and I crossed paths, and then that's where Mike Pettin and Kevin and I all crossed paths was at the Jets. And then we all ended up in Cleveland together. Um, Kevin is a very humble guy. Um, very bright. Um, I think I would agree with that. I don't think Kevin is, has the ego to where if he's going to listen to people, he's got really good, good, good coaches on that staff. You know, you got Mike Pettin, you got Ed Donatel. I mean, those, those two guys on the defensive side of the football are, are Greg Minuski. Greg Minuski. Yeah. and, um, you know, so he surrounded himself with, with really good people and guys that have been in the NFL a long time. Uh, Kevin is, is going to be aggressive. Um, he uh, everything will be very, very detailed. Um, there'll be you'll see ways that, you know, they're going to have different ways to that. They know they can, get, you know, try to get after the Eagles a little bit. Uh, you know, I haven't watched any of the tape. So but Kevin will have all that down. And I'm really happy for him. You know, it's a big win for him last weekend at home, you know, to start off one and oh at home. And, and, you know, we always say the division games almost count as two. So, uh, you know, not only you win a game in, in the NFC, but you win a game in the division at home to open your head coaching career against and against the Green Bay Packers. So that's like the coaching trifecta right there. So I'm really happy for Kevin and, and he'll do a really good job. there. They're, they're a good. That's a good football team. Now. now it is a good football team. And you mentioned the uh, home field advantage. The Eagles will be home for Monday night football primetime affair. We saw last week they went into Detroit. They had not sold. Standing room only tickets, coach, in I think like six years or so. Everybody was buying into the Dan Campbell hype. Now it's Philadelphia's turn. They come home, maybe a little home field advantage. I got to ask you, what's it like being down there on the side? I would imagine it doesn't matter how long you coach in this league. First home game, primetime affair, still going to be a little bit of butterflies, even though it's Coach Seriani's second year in the job. You still get a little bit of butterflies, yes? If you don't get butterflies, in my opinion, as a player or a coach, I don't think you care enough, to Absolutely. be honest with you. I mean, I, if, if – and, like, we're all human, and, you know, my, I can relate a little bit. I've been on both sides of that, not in the first opening game, but, you know, in 2018, I'm no see the Vikings, and we come into Philadelphia, and it was a – it was – I don't know when I, when I got cut out. So when I got cut off there, so um, we ended up winning the football game, but it was a dog fight and it, it's going to be that, you know, on Monday night, um, you know, the Eagles fans, like they always are, will be fired up and ready to roll, um, which has always been impressive. It's one of the best home field advantages in all football. I don't care if you're talking high school, college or the pros. Yeah. Uh, it's one of the best in, in all of football. And, and obviously on that stage on Monday night will be, I wish I could be there gonna be freaking sweet it is it's gonna be outstanding atmosphere everybody's gonna be riled up the ocean casino is gonna have the pre and post game down there in atlantic city and we will see you know kirk cousins is a guy as you alluded to he could sit back there he could pick you apart i think he works the short to intermediate game really well and you know he he might not get the respect he deserves coach but at the end of the day this is a $40 million quarterback. I mean, Kirk Cousins makes $40 million a year. So let me ask you this. What's the best way to attack Kirk Cousins in this offense? We only saw, I think, 15% blitz rate last week. Jonathan Gannon says he needs to make some adjustments. How would you kind of uh, apply the pressure on Kirk Cousins, I would assume? 
I, I think that's how you get after any quarterback. I mean, that's the no whatever statement of the day, but that, that I think that's how you get it. Anytime you can get a quarterback off the spot, you know, eight yards, eight and a half yards deep where your right foot is, anytime you can get him off that spot, I, I think, and make him move his feet and make him rush his decision making. Because playing quarterback is it's about three things. It's about decision making, timing, and accuracy. And when you force a quarterback maybe to make a quicker decision than he wants, his timing gets thrown off, and then obviously the accuracy gets thrown off. So all those three of those things really work together in, in playing the quarterback position at, at any level. So, you know, working with Kirk for a year, I think Kirk Cousins is one of the most underrated quarterbacks in the league. Um, you, you look at his stat line. I know stats. I, I get it. It's all about wins. I'm, I, let's just put that aside for a second. All right. Kirk Cousins won a lot of football games, too. But I get it where they haven't been to the NFC Championship. They haven't been they haven't won the Super Bowl. I got it. But, you know, you look at 18, his first year at the Vikings, he was the first player in NFL history to throw for, you know, over 4,000 yards, 30 touchdowns, 10 or less interceptions, and 70% completion percentage. First guy in NFL history. So, I mean, you know, Kirk can throw the football, okay? He can freaking throw it. And he's got a much stronger arm than I gave him credit for when I was in Philadelphia. He's in Washington. I worked with him in Minnesota. Um, you know, Kirk's not that big of a guy. Like, he's, I wouldn't say he's slight, but he's he's not that big of a guy. But the thing is, knock on wood for him, he's always available. I'm not sure he's ever missed a game. Yeah, you're and, right. You know, um, I I really think he he's a, a really a really good player and and people knock on him for this and for that and I'm like the kid has guys a good player no and availability is still your best ability I don't care who you are what position you play and we're uh, uh, glad to be joined by Coach Flip here longtime NFL offensive coordinator of course quarterback coach for world champion Philadelphia Eagles and I want to ask you about a quarterback now shifting gears within the division. Dak Prescott goes down. The Dallas Cowboys were ill prepared for this situation, coach, because when it came down and when it came time to 53 uh, man cut down, they only kept Dak on the roster. They thought so much of their backups, Cooper Rush and Ben DiNucci, they didn't even include him on the 53 man roster. Now, Cooper Rush is back, he'll get the start in the short term. I mean, how do you prepare for this if you're a coach? Obviously, you've got to change the game plan. We're hearing six weeks, maybe eight weeks, which is half the season. Uh, I joked down in Atlantic City, I got, you know, a six, six foot hole dug in the beach here and ready for the Cowboys' demise. Any chance they survive this uh, setback here? And how do you game plan and prepare if you're the Dallas Cowboys? Well, they're still an NFL team, and, and they have really good players. They have explosive players. They're, they're, they're good on defense. So I think if they can, if they can kind of slow the game down a little bit, I, I, I think that, you know, Zeke's going to have to – he's going to have to carry a load here. I mean, he's going to have to be a really a important piece of the plan here. And in, in my past, when we've had situations like this, we've tried to milk the clock a little bit and, and play a 17-14 game. Um, where, you know, I don't give the play till 20 seconds and we don't snap it till two or three seconds. And, um, you know, you can play the game that way. Um, you know, and I, I feel bad for Dak. I know we're on an Eagles, Eagles show here, but I mean, you don't want to see any player get hurt, you know, especially a player of that caliber, uh, you know, but hopefully he'll get back sooner than later, but it's, it's hard. I'm not going to lie. It's, it's, it, it's, it's, you know, we were fortunate in 17 where, we had, you know, Nick Foles there, you know, as a backup. I'm not saying that we wanted Carson to go down or tear his ACL. I mean, Carson was the MVP of the league, going to be the MVP of the league that year. And, um, but at least we had an established guy that not only played games, but and played games in Philadelphia. I mean, you know, we were very, very fortunate to have, to be able to move on to Nick. And um, they, it doesn't seem like they have that down there you know, right now. Uh, so, I've learned in the NFL, I'm mad at myself when I'm shocked about something. So if they made a move, it wouldn't shock me. If they make, if they didn't make a move, it wouldn't shock me. Uh, but it's really hard to sign a guy mid-year and expect him to come in and play. I mean, it, you know, when, when we traded Sam Bradford to the Vikings, I think he sat the first week or, you know, played a lim limited role. It's just, it's just hard 
Uh, and then obviously you got to give up. I think the Vikings gave the Eagles a first round draft pick. So now you got to give up draft capital. Mm -hmm. So there's that whole domino effect of things that can happen when a situation like this happens. And uh, it's unfortunate for the Cowboys and obviously it's unfortunate for Dak, but um, you know, hopefully he's back sooner than later. Well, you mentioned good friend Nick Foles. If I was the Dallas Cowboys, I'd be maybe making a phone call, putting in an inquiry there if I, if I was Jerry Jones or, and Will McClay. Um, speaking of old friends, Carson Wentz got off to a W against our good friend Doug Peterson. Uh, more good than bad, a bunch of touchdowns, couple interceptions. Not sure how much you got to see of it, but they get those same Detroit Lions in Detroit. Uh Thoughts and impressions from Carson week one. And I thought he looked good. Yeah. I was happy for him. I thought he looked real good. Now, I know he had back to back picks. I saw him. I mean, it's, you know, right. it happens. But I mean, I thought he played pretty good. I thought those guys did a nice job schematically. Um, you know, uh, it, they did a really nice, I thought they did a really nice job up front. It didn't, it didn't look like, like I said, I, I watched some of the game. I didn't watch the whole thing. It didn't look like Carson was getting a ton of pressure. So I thought they did a good job up front against the Jaguars D line, and and uh, that was a big win for those guys. And well, like if they said, keep we, we talked last week about Carson a little bit. Yeah, it's it's and we talked about fit where he needed them and they needed him, and and usually good things happen. And I was happy for him that that came to fruition. Well, if they keep playing the way they do, and and they get pick up the W this week, suddenly they're two and zero. We just mentioned Dak Prescott's out. Suddenly the door is it, open again. It's funny in the, in the NFL, season. Rick, and Tone, how when you start stacking those games, th that's when it becomes fun because obviously you're winning, number one. Obviously that's winning's fun. We all know that. But every game now becomes a little bit more, more important. When yeah. you get on a roll, man, it, it, oh, this this there's a little flow to the season. Like, you know, hey, can we dig ourselves out from a three-game losing streak? Hey, can, can we – not start reading the press clippings after a four game winning streak, you know, Hey, let's challenge ourselves to do this. Let's challenge ourselves to do that. So you're always battling either side of the coin, you know, and that's, that's part of the fun part of, of navigating through an NFL season. Yeah. And I think it's about getting hot at the right time too. Yeah. Like in 2017, you guys were riding, riding high into the playoffs. It's about that too. You, you know, you don't want to shoot your load too early and 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 peak too early because it's a long season, especially with the added game. Uh, it's a gauntlet, right? And so uh, we'll be keeping an eye on that for sure. Uh, the New York Giants have a lot of hot hope and optimism too after week one. And I, I think they've got an easy matchup. I think Carolina. So suddenly the, the NFC East could become <laughs> a lot more difficult than the Eagles fans had anticipated. We talked about it last week. That was going to be interesting division. Yes, and we did. Boy, yes, it's did. true. And it's going to be fun to watch. And um, like I told you guys last week, Coach Dayball now, I, I told you, it changed the whole script and trying to establish something there. He went forward on that two-point conversion. And hats off to him, man. I'll tell That's you. Great, I said great, great job. Brian, biggest day balls of them all, man. To go for that play, what that is gutsy, and why not, right? Why not? Why not? Why I love not? that. I love it. Okay, and, and and you know, my dad grew up a huge Giants fan because he grew up in Massachusetts, so I grew up like following the Giants. I still follow Giants. I worked there for two years, but obviously they, they've been down and out. If you, if you're a new coach right, and they've been down and out the last what eight years, ten years, a decade, yeah. right? I mean. And, and and why not? Why not make go for two? Yeah. In your first game as a head coach, you get trying to establish new culture. Even if you don't get it, the players know that you had trust in them. Period. Yeah, the even Giants if you don't get it. And it's going to still go a long ways. And my hats off to Coach Dayball. He, I, I'm, I'm, I've been impressed with him for a long time. Yeah. Um, but now I've gotten to just be around him a little bit. You know, um, even more impressed. I think they got it right. Finally, because yeah. they were they were really antsy to get run talk, call, Coughlin out of town. And they went through oh, no. the coaching carousel there. Right. They went through uh, Shermer and McAdoo and uh, Judge. And finally, finally, they got a guy that I can believe in. And let's be let's be frank. The Giants are an all time historical franchise. The league is just a better place. It is. New York football Giants. It is. Football. It's like the NBA. And I know we're on the NFL show here but sure. the, the nba is better when the knicks are relevant it just they it just is it's more fun you Absolutely. know it's just more fun 
And, and the same way with the Giants. It's, yeah. it's more fun when the Giants are relevant. And it's hard to believe over the last five years, the Giants and Jets are tied for the worst record, believe it or not. So I, I wasn't, I knew that. I wasn't going to say that on the show to, to <laughs> throw uh, dirt on the grave, you know, like, right. but I knew that stat. And, and when I read that about a month ago, I was, that kind of blew me away a little bit. Yeah. Well, I know, Coach, we're keeping you a little bit longer here. I want to get your thoughts and impressions on some other quarterbacks, some other week one thoughts. Yeah. We saw. Uh, Patrick Mahomes again last Ooh. night. I didn't get to see too much of it, but um, you know, we mentioned Hertz was was blitzed. Uh, I think 15 times. Mahomes was blitzed last week 21 times. He saw five touchdowns in week one. He had another uh, near flawless game. 24 for 35, two touchdowns, zero interceptions. The Chiefs keep on winning games despite the cast of characters seem to continue to turn over and change. But this Patrick Mahomes, I mean, I just said last segment, he is the best pound-for-pound, dollar-for-dollar player in the NFL. I would agree. I mean, you know, there's some defensive players that are really good that can change the game, you know, with the sack fumble or whatever. But this guy touches the ball every single snap. I mean, you're waiting as a fan or as a, a teammate or as a coach when you're watching this guy. You're, you're what What's going to happen next? OK, so you're going to throw a sidearm pass. Is he going to spin out and, and throw the ball 60 yards down the field? Um, you're just waiting. You're on the edge of your seat watching this guy to see what's what's going to happen next. And uh, it, it's it's a lot of fun. I mean, I was out there this spring to watch them in their mandatory camp and the command. The thing that's I don't think it's talked about enough because he's so dynamic in what he does is there's no doubt who's in charge on that field. Like when you watch their practice, I mean, it's, it's, you can really tell the maturation in that piece of his, if his game is, you know, to where it needs to be for a franchise guy. I mean, there, there's no doubt who's, who's the sheriff out there, you know, and obviously coach Reed is the boss, but when it comes to the practice and the, and, and all that, he runs the show. Yeah. And they've done a great job, uh, you know, patching the offensive lineup year to year and then, you know, Justin Watson comes out of nowhere. Uh, you know, McCole Hardman is stepping up now. And uh, Tyree Koo, it's like, <laughs> we I don't, don't even know. notice, right? It's it, unbelievable. It's, it's amazing. And, and obviously they have the dyna dynamic tight end. I mean, he he yeah. opens up a lot of things in, yeah, for the outside guys as well. I mean, you have to always have a body on that guy, on, on Kelsey. And and uh, when you have a dynamic player, I swear I've – you get dynamic court. Let's talk about a, like a dynamic receiver. People are always like, well, you know, he only affects, you know, eight, eight plays a game. No. Okay. So this is where I've had some, some, some vocal discussions with people in the past about receiving receiver play is it helps the run game because you have, a lot of times you have to play a, a safe, two high safeties when you have a dynamic player, like a, dynamic wide out of Justin Jefferson, uh, AJ Brown, uh, two guys like that that we're going to see on Monday night. You have to account for those guys every single play. So a lot of times that opens up things for other people. It opens up the run game. It opens up a lot of things. So they have a, not only a dynamic quarterback, but they have a dynamic, another dynamic player in the skill position that opens up a lot of things for everybody. Yeah. I, I would say Kelsey's the best tight end in the game right now. So when absolutely two best players at their position on the same offense, Mahomes and Kelsey. Wow. And, and we have a term, a term I've used. I don't want to say we, a term I've used in the run game with tight ends is it just lose with dignity, man. Like, you know, you don't have to be a trained killer like in the run game, but lose with dignity. And Kelsey blocks his butt off in the run game. So not only is he dynamic in, in the pass game, but that guy is, is not a liability in the run game at all. And, and so – Again, it just shows you great players want to be great at everything. They want to be great at everything. No, you're right. And I would I would argue Rob Gronkowski probably didn't get enough credit for his blocking capability. Agreed. Big plays catching the ball, right? But he could Absolutely. Gronk. Ahead. Gronk. I mean, you see him get just as fired up after he pancakes somebody than he does in a touchdown pass. Yeah, no doubt about it. Hey, Coach Flip here with Rick Saratella, the football playbook coach. I know you got to go. Any other performances from week one? Anything that stood out to you? Anything else uh, that you want to talk about before we let you boogie? Yeah, I'd be shocked if we don't see Joe Burrow bounce back. 
you know, um, I, I'd be really shocked that he's, he's too high character kid and, and they're, they're too good on offense for him not to bounce back. Um, I, I think, you know, Josh Allen will obviously will continue to, he, he, to continue to play well. Um, these are some of the guys I wrote down and we've already talked about Mahomes and cousins and uh, I'm just excited for, for everyone, you know, in Philadelphia and Rick and Tony, I'm excited for you guys to, for Monday night. Let's go. This oh, is going to be a good one. So fired up, go. man. Yeah, no. And, and real quick on Burrow, like, I don't know if it was the appendix cause he had that whole procedure just a couple weeks ago, or if it was yeah. just a bad game, but, if I was a betting man, I would say he's probably not going to turn the ball over five times, probably the rest of the season at any single. Right. Um, he had a very similar game in 2020 uh, 20, last year, week two against us in Chicago, where he threw back to back to back interceptions. Boom, boom, boom. One of them returned for a touchdown. And obviously they went on to win the Super Bowl. Um, an interesting study, which now I had, like I told you guys, I have a lot of time on my hands. An interesting study to talk about that I don't think it's talked about enough is what's the win loss ratio of teams that did not play their starters in the preseason? You know, I, th th that would be, in, in my opinion, have we done, have no we right done the, answer to that? there's no right or wrong answer to that because if I'm a head coach, okay, I would rather lose week one than lose a primetime player playing six snaps in the first preseason game. Uh, you know, I'd rather roll the dice and say, Hey, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to go to Vegas and bet, bet my money that this player is going to continue to do this as he gets more playing time and more comfortable. Uh, but it, that'd be an interesting thing to, to look at. We need Stats Inc. to get on that. Somebody... Let's go. Let's get that <laughs> we, hey, Tone, we need an intern to get on that for next week so we can break it down and chop it up. Coach, you mentioned you have some time on your hands. Hopefully we could have you back uh, next week if you're available. We'd love to. This is All a lot right. of fun, man. Here I love being with you. Rick, I love being with you and Tone. All right, let's awesome. book it. We'll come back next football Friday. Until then, uh, you know, we'll bottle up those emotions. We'll uh, watch all the excitement. Hey, don't on peak too Sunday. soon, baby. Don't peak too soon. Game's not till Monday night. Right. All right. And Hassan Reddick talked about that on a primetime game. You got to pace yourself on those exactly. Monday night football matchups, right? So uh, we'll pace ourselves and we'll come back. We'll chop it up. We'll break it down. Coach John D. Filippo of your world champion. Philadelphia Eagles. Thank you so much, coach. Thanks, guys. Have a great have a great weekend.